Uh, we did convoy patrols. Um, uh, the patrol was about 13 and a half hours. I have done longer. I've, I've done 18 hours, I think, at one time. But normally, uh, 13 and a half hours was the standard patrol. And uh, we either did what they call a box search, where you did a thing called a creeping line ahead search. So you would go forward, then you would turn right, then you would go turn left and go forward again, and then you'd turn left again. So you completed a box, and then you'd go forward again. And you were doing this probably while another aircraft was doing the same thing in parallel on your starboard sort of thing, so that you were covering between you quite a lot of water. Really. That was the idea. And the idea was to try and keep the submarines down because until they got snorkeled later in the war, they had to come to the surface to recharge their batteries. So, of course, when they came to the surface, you had a bit of chance of um, attacking them, you see. The box searches weren't really with convoys. That was a different thing. With with convoys, you flew round to the front of the convoy uh, and, and sort of flew back and forth. Then you came round the side and flew round the back. So, again, you were sort of keeping the subs down. I mean, you were you were looking at the sea and nothing but the sea <laughs> for hours and hours and hours and hours, as you say. It, uh, I mean, quite honestly, you had automatic pilot. You had uh, George, you, and uh, you, you could tend to drop off to sleep when you were right, George. Yes, I'm afraid you did. Yeah. It was the noise of the engine all the time. And they were sort of a bit uh, sleepifying. Uh, that's why we changed watches every hour, you see. And uh, um, there was one watching all the time, and then he had time off sort of thing, you know, that, that was the, the way we did it. So, okay, you might, if you're lucky, pick out a periscope, but generally uh, you're looking for shipping uh, and or a submarine is, is, is a ship, but you'd be very lucky if you picked out a, a periscope. You could do, you might do, you... It depends really what the state of the sea is. If the sea is if it's at all rough, then uh, you'd be uh, lucky to pick out a periscope uh, because of the state of the water. I have mentioned earlier on that we hadn't any navigational aids um, in, in the Bay of Biscay, and our navigation wasn't, you know, wasn't very accurate to, to say the least but um, we probably knew where we were within 10 or 12 miles uh, which was good enough for us but not good enough for the Navy and somebody invented a system of navigation which was called Consul Consul was a German system it wasn't British they had the same problem as we had about navigation in U-boats, U-boats who were under the water all day long didn't know how much currents in the water had forced them off uh, the track that they wished to, to go on. And they invented this system of console, which was a system of dots and dashes. And we had to count how many dots there were. It was done on, on, uh, on radio. Uh, and we just had to pick up the uh, appropriate wavelength um, of the um, of the beacons that were being used, and tuned into um, a couple of beacons. There was one one at Brest. There was one in uh, uh, in in Lisbon. That was that was two. Uh, there was one in Norway, but that wasn't any good to us. We were too far away. But one of the things about this console system was that that uh, it was accurate to about fifteen hundred miles. And so that covered everywhere that we were flying in the Bay of Biscay. We did have um, other radar systems like G, but G was only accurate to about 100. Uh, that was no good to us out in the middle of the Atlantic, but, but coming coming back to base, it, it, it enabled us to find base if, 
if if uh, there was any problem in finding bass, we could just put the G system on, and uh, there was a beacon, a G beacon at Pembroke Dock where we were flying from, and we just honed in on the on that peak, and uh, we got hold of this system, and it came to us via Portugal. Now Portugal was a a non-combatant country; they were neutral, and they were our oldest allies. And they passed this information to us because there was a consul beacon in Lisbon, in Portugal. So my crew were selected to, to, to trial this consul and we were given all the information. We were given the special maps that were, and it was because that I was one of the senior navigators on this quadrant and they wanted the tests to be done um, as accurately as possible. I mean, they didn't know what I was doing. Nobody else on board knew what I was doing. The pilot did. What we were afraid of was that the Germans might find out that we intercepted this system and and cut the system off. Now, if they cut the system off to us, of course, they would have cut it off to their own U-boats and, and aeroplanes that were using the same system. So when we went to briefing before we went on a trip, the pilot and I, the captain of the plane and I, had a special briefing. There were only two of us on this briefing, and my navigation was directed to everything that I did. I would check with consul, uh, and we we eventually worked out after a few um, flights that that um, the Germans didn't know we were using consul. They didn't know we'd got hold of it. They didn't suspect that we got hold of it. Because, but I don't suppose Bomber Command used it because they didn't need to. They had, you know, H2S and things like that. That um, we need, we needed, we needed a range. I and mean, when we we got to thirteen or fourteen hundred miles away from base. the 18th of August 1944, I'll always remember the date, because actually that was exactly three years from the time I started my Air Force career at ACRC. It was off Saint-Nazaire, actually. It was between Saint-Nazaire and La Palice in the um, Bay of Biscay, actually. We were on a box search at the time, and, uh, and the story is, you see... <laughs> We had that. We had this loo, uh, flushing loo, and Badistock had gone down. And he was sitting on the loo, and I was flying the aircraft when we spotted the sub. Well, it was a periscope. We just saw the periscope. It was about three miles ahead of us on the port bow. Of course, we had radar, which helped um, pick up bleeps you know, and that sort of thing, but. Uh, this wasn't radar. We spotted this visually, actually. This was the thing. What we realized was that for years, hours and hours and hours, you see nothing but wind lanes. And then we suddenly noticed something was funny because the wake from the periscope was against the wind lanes. And that's what alerted us to it, you see, and uh, so we, that's how we really spotted the sub. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, well, am I going to be able to do that? You know, uh, it would be quite a thrill, but sort of I wasn't as good as he was, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, I pressed the buzzer. We had an alarm system, which uh, three sh short bursts for S for sub. <laughs> And I pressed that. So that was the signal for all the crew to get to their action stations. And um, anyway, Badistock obviously heard this and came up with a little companionway between the two pilot seats from the lower deck. And uh, he came up uh, pulling his trousers up. And uh, someone shoved a a helmet on so he plug into the intercom and he plugged into the intercom and they said there's the sun and uh, so he got into the second pilot's seat and he signaled to me to keep 
turning the aircraft round, and I started doing the run-in, he took over and uh, he pressed the tit and, uh, as I say, we got a straddle and it was confirmed as a kill. But, uh, so, but that was all quite amusing, really. <laughs> Made for a good story. We formatted with a, a Fock Wolf four-engined. Um, a four-engined bomber that used to... Um, uh, they they used to send the few fucker. They used to pick up convoys and radio back to his base that um, convoys were in such and such a position and they'd send U boats out, uh, divert U boats to the convoys and things like that. And uh, we came across this fuck wolf and we got close to it. And, and in the end, um, we, we were just about wingtip to wingtip and waving to each other. And he was out, he was out looking for, for convoys and it wasn't his job to shoot us down. And we were in the same position that, that our job wasn't to shoot down Fuck Wolf. It was to spot U boats. So, um, we both, uh, you know, we just sort of waved to each other and then said goodbye to each other and got, got about our job. Um, on another occasion, um, I was in. Look, you didn't fire at it at all. No, we just just waved to each other and smiled, and it was, it was wonderful, really. Uh, it was a great experience. That it, you know, it made me think that it's, it's not people that cause wars; it's politicians. We'd lost a few aircraft. It was right at the height of of uh, of action. I should think that. Whilst I was on the squadron, which was uh, uh, about ten months, that um, we probably lost five or six aircraft. That's twelve people on an aircraft, and but we also probably in that time sunk five or six U-boats. It was Ju eighty eights that were the main trouble to us. And um, we, our rear gunner called up and uh, said, uh, saw these JU-88s coming up. And um, the thing was, I was a sort of spare pilot at the time. There was the skipper and the second pilot, or, or third pilot, whoever it was. I was the spare pilot at the time, so I hadn't got a job. And... I always remember, you see, the the back seats of the uh, pilot seats were reinforced. They were bulletproof. That's the idea. So they, you know, if you got shot up the back, because the bullets wouldn't wouldn't come through. But uh, so I hadn't got that. I didn't know what, what to do. I just sort of lay on the floor and hope for the best. <laughs> I must admit, it was rather scary. <laughs> Not having anything to do, you know, you couldn't be sort of taking avoiding action or anything like that. You just had to lie there, <laughs> sitting target. Anyway, that was all right. We got away with it. But the Catalina was an interesting... Uh aircraft I and mean, it's one thing its throttles were in the roof which uh, uh made it a bit and, and the the uh the control column instead of having individual they had a sort of one that applied to the uh or worked for the main the first pilot and the second pilot came up as a bar across with your control wheel on and it had various switches on this bar. It was a simple thing but somehow the way they designed it and the, the floats, which prevent the lateral stability on the water on the Catalina, folded up onto the ends of the wingtips and became uh, almost almost streamlined. So the, on both types of flying boats, the, the, a lot of thought had gone in beforehand, more than I think on many aircraft. I think that's why a lot of people are not exactly hanker after them, but they're fond of their memory of them.
it was nothing like as good as the Sunderland. I mean, uh, Sunderland was a gentleman's aircraft. I always had a upstairs, downstairs, flushing loo, uh, wardroom, galley, cook your meals. I mean, it, it was Sunderland was out of this world. Uh, Catalina was all right. I mean, they did have things. They had a galley and uh, that, that sort of thing. They had these blisters. Uh, we didn't have blisters in Sunderland. They were the things that stuck out each side of a Catalina. And um, because there were two sorts of Catalinas, you could have an amphibian, which would land on land as well. Sunderland, you couldn't. It would only land on water. It, it was a bit a bit slow, I thought. It was, well, it was, it was slow. It was much slower aircraft than the Sunderland, I mean, the Catalina. Uh, mind you, it had a wonderful endurance. It could fly for hours and hours and hours. But um, it, I, I didn't think it handled it as well as the Sunderland now. But we, at that time, uh, receiving from America the Catalina flying boat, which I suppose I flew nearly every one that came into the country. Fascinating aircraft, utterly different from the Sunderland. Longer range, much slower, <laughs> and a difficult, a difficult uh, aircraft to handle on the water. That's because of its design. You had two Pratt Whitney engines, rather close to one another, being a parasol type aircraft. That is a high wing. The, uh, and so, if you wanted to turn to left or right or part, port and starboard in a, on the water, you had a little difficulty. There was no turning movement. Well, of course, you had to learn seamanship and you had to know which was the right of way on the water and, you know, steam giving way to sail and all that sort of thing. And uh, and you had to learn techniques of mooring up. I mean, mooring up was quite tricky because, well, again, you would normally moor up into the tide you, the tide would be coming against you and you would come up to the moorings. But sometimes it was difficult if the wind was behind you. So it was, that, was a, that was a tricky thing, mooring up. But uh, what you did, uh, you, you wound back the front turret and then you, the pilot would come up slowly to the buoy on, on the left-hand side, port side, and... Um, they would then try and grab the trailing thing in the water and then they would get that up and fix it on and then once you were firmly fixed on there, you could switch your engines off. We were going to go down and land in the Bay of Biscay to, to pick up um, some Americans that were in dinghies. And there was already a uh, Sunderland flying boat down there that, that um, damaged was damaged on takeoff, and, uh, and so they had to be rescued. And and there were the, these people out of the uh, out of the American aircraft that had forced landed there, um, but they wouldn't give us permission to land. Uh, base wouldn't give us permission to land, and at the same time, told us that that if we did land, that it it would be under the threat of court martial that uh, it wasn't a done thing. You know, people think that flying boats can just land anywhere on water, but they can't. Because of swell, the 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 weakest part of a, a Sunderland flying boat is the um, floats. And the floats uh, fixed to the wings are not, are not very rigid. And uh, if you hit some swell and, and uh, the float comes uh, off, the wing, the wing will capsize. That's the Sunderland flying boat there. If you know what I mean, those, that, that boat's only as strong as those, as those floats. Uh, of course, uh, with the engines, you can turn 
you know, in a circle, if you like. Uh, but what we used to do was we used to have drogues which came out to the side, uh, and you put these drogues out, and um, they would slow you down, you see, because the water would sort of go through the drogue. So gradually uh, the, that would slow you down, and so you aimed to come out with the drogues on into the tide uh, and uh, slow down as far as you could. The chaps were out on the wound back thing with a boat hook, you see, and their idea was to hook up the thing and then fix it on on the um, bollard. And then, of course, you, came, you had a dinghy who came out and uh, took you off. What you had to do was you had to trim your propellers so that they triangle of the three like the three one one sticking up and two down you had to trim them so that the down ones you could go through in other words in other words the dinghies could sort of get through those you see uh, uh, oh yes and the bilges of course we had to pump out the bilges and that sort of thing that was another thing you had to do because water got in the bilges and uh, sloshed about been frightened ever since ever since the Air Force was founded. They've been frightened that the Navy would want to take flying boats back into the Navy, which were part of the Royal Naval Air Service based at Felixstowe in the First World War. And when in 1918 the Royal Air Force took them over, uh, from then on, the, the Air Force never seems to want to use the word ship or boat talks about marine craft which will go and service the aircraft or take people out to them. And uh, the SS Manila, uh, I think they were worried that if they they took on a, a, a seaplane tender that was a ship, the Navy would say, that's got to be ours, everything that's the ship is ours. And that they bought such a wreck of a ship that I think the Navy wouldn't dare to look at it. At least that's the story I've heard. And now for number three. So easy, full of character and typically British, you must know her at once. <laughs> Here you are then. Short Sunderland stops to show you a deep hull armed with three power-operated gun turrets. The hull divided into three equal parts by these steps. Four radials and that high fin and rudder. Incidentally, this earlier model of the Sunderland had only two turrets. Long-range reconnaissance and convoy escort are her normal roles. Many a Hun submarine crew have seen her, if only they'd lived to describe it. 